Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, a uh, warm welcome from DBT NIAB to all our participants of uh, Star College, DBT Star Colleges. And uh, I hope all of you are well, despite uh, the ongoing pandemic. I think we'll see the oh end of this pandemic very soon. And uh, for today's program, I invite Dr. Sandeep Goel to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sanjay Singh. Dr. Goel. Thank you, Dr. Bappa. Thank you very much, Dr. Bappa. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the students and faculty of the 13 DBT Star Colleges. Uh, it's a privilege to have you all here. So in the series of uh, Science Say 2 lecture, uh, this is our 14th lecture. And uh, it gave me a, a tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjay Singh, our new faculty who recently joined the NIAB. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Singh received his PhD in uh, biotechnology or uh, nanobiotechnology from CSIR uh, um, National Chemical Laboratory, that is in Pune. And he subsequently worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, University of Central Florida and at Pennsylvania State University, United States of America. He worked as an uh, assistant professor and subsequently as associate professor in Ahmedabad University before joining NIAB in, uh, in, in this year. He's also visiting scientists at RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and University of 20, Netherlands. His broad area of interest uh, is uh, nanoscience and uh, nanotechnology. I, I would request everybody to mute their mic. Uh, it's uh, causing a lot of disturbance here. Okay. So coming to Dr. Sanjay Singh's research interest, he's really interested in nanoscience and nanotechnology and their biological application, including biosensing, cell-specific targeting, delivery of drug and vaccine, and chemical catalysis. He has already published several papers, almost amounting to 19, and in international peer-reviewed journals of, of repute, uh, several book chapters, and has edited uh, uh, almost three, five books and uh, is awarded with number of uh, national and international scientific awards. And uh, uh, so I welcome him uh, to present uh, uh, 14 Science Setu lecture and part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav uh, 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 series that we are conducting at NIAB. So over to Dr. Sanjay Singh. Thank you, Dr. Goel. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Okay, yes. good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goel, for the introduction and, and Bappa for organizing all these. Uh, it's really uh, fun to connect with, um, you know, undergraduate and postgraduate students, because as, as Dr. Goel mentioned, uh, that prior to, uh, you know, NIAB, I was uh, working as, a, a, you know, faculty in Ahmedabad University, where I was teaching mainly you know, undergraduate and master's students. And uh, I know how, how fun it is to, you know, work with them, whether it is teaching or even, uh, you know, whether they are in your lab doing certain projects. So it's it's always fun to, to interact with them and, and work with them. So here I'm again, uh, probably sharing some of my uh, thoughts about nanoscience and nanotechnology, especially nanobiotechnology with um, undergraduate and postgraduate students here. So uh, I hope my slide is visible to everybody. Yes, it is. It is okay. visible, Sanjay. Yes. Great. Thank you. So as, as you can see here that uh, I've given this topic, nanobiotechnology, introduction and application, uh, you know, being a biotechnologist, I'm more biased towards nanobiotechnology. But you know, in my lecture, you will find, you know, that I'll be talking something which is not uh, really biology along with biology. So, so bear with me uh, on that note. So uh, if I, uh, yeah, so nanobiotechnology. So let's, let's have some you know, definition and, and basic understanding about nanobiotechnology. So basically this nanobiotechnology, you can um, uh, you know, understand by three, four, uh, different uh, ways. 
one is like uh, if you bifurcate this nano and biotechnology, so it's a nanotechnology and biotechnology that itself suggests that there's something happening between nanotechnology and biotechnology, it's kind of marriage between nanotechnology and biotechnology. So mostly what you do here is, uh, you know, you use nanomaterials for, for biological applications, right? So you may be interested in taking nanoparticles and uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, blocking certain biological processes within mammalian cells, or if you want to promote certain processes, certain biological processes using nanoparticles, that's again, uh, will fall into nanobiotechnology. Other thing is that nanoparticles, you can take nanoparticles and develop certain devices, certain new devices to realize. That, uh, can you all please uh, uh, mute your uh, uh, mic so that there's less disturbance in between? Thank you. So, you know, using nanoparticles, you can develop certain methods or, or devices you can develop by which you can study the biological process. That's one thing. Other thing is that for realizing the applications, you can utilize nanoparticles to uh, for, for various applications. Uh, like you can see here on your uh, right hand side, like in therapeutics, biodiagnostics, you can develop imaging, proteomics, hyperthermia, etc. And certain of these um, applications I'll be talking in my uh, today's lecture. So uh, one more thing is that, let's say there's some already uh, tool available, okay? But in order to in increase or improve the efficiency of that tool, you can again use nanoparticles or nanotechnology that will again fall into nanobiotechnology. So before I go deep into biotechnology and its applications, let's understand that what is the importance of uh, this, this uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials or nanoparticles. So apart from biotechnology, uh, there's a big market of consumer goods. I don't know whether uh, you have realized or not so far, but I'm sure in your daily routine life, you might be using certain products that has nanomaterial in it, okay? So I'll give you the simple uh, example of, um, you know, refrigerators. Nowadays, refrigerators are coming, which are having a silver nanoparticle coating in it so that they uh, sort of produce antimicrobial environment in your refrigerator. Okay. Why? Why do you need nanoparticle in your refrigerator? You know, temperature is down there, right? So if you use some, you know, biological agent in it due to low temperature, the activity might not, uh, the kind of activity you expect might not be there. But this limitation is not with nanoparticles, right? So therefore, nanoparticles can be used as a coating material of the interior of your refrigerator so as they uh, express antimicrobial uh, activity therein. Uh, I have uh, mentioned here again uh, certain products. Uh, all these products have nanoparticles. Very uh, good example is your sunscreens. Right, it has zinc oxide nanoparticle, titanium dioxide. Right, so these are certain nanoparticles which are already there in certain of the products that we regularly use. We may not realize that, but they are there. So if you uh, see here, I mean this this data is a little old, maybe three four year old. About eighteen hundred plus nano based consumer products are already there in the market, and about six hundred plus companies are manufacturing that. And this is happening in 30 plus countries, okay? So most of the category uh, falls into about health and fitness. Uh, as I mentioned, silver nanoparticle is the most uh, used nanoparticle for consumer product because of uh, its antimicrobial uh, activity. And uh, there are certain drawbacks to it because uh, there's a large number of products where what kind of nanomaterial composition they are using in their uh, product, it's not declared, that's one thing. Other thing is that um, most of these nanoparticles, like in sunscreen, they they come in, 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 in contact with us, like sunscreens we apply on our skin. So therefore the, the detailed toxicity or hazardous uh, information related to those nanoparticles to 
our skin or our health must be uh, you know clearly uh, investigated i mean there are data but i feel that more investigation is required uh, further to is it like most of the companies they use nanoparticle but they they are unable to sort of uh, say that what kind of nanoparticle they are using maybe this is the limitation with the characterization maybe they are they are not fully characterizing the kind of nanoparticle they are using right so with this uh, some of the limitations uh, you know i would say that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, products that we are using uh, that has uh, nano material in them so uh, let's move to nano let's try to understand what is nano so first question comes like how is small is nano we all know this nanometer micrometer meter kilometer but then let's understand uh, that how is small is this nano so uh, if you can imagine earth the size of earth with the size of this soccer ball you know i hope you all can imagine that how is small this soccer ball is compared to earth same is the uh, you know relation between nanoparticle with soccer ball okay so one nanoparticle is is that is small to soccer ball as soccer ball is a uh, size of soccer ball compared to earth okay and we all know by definition that you know nanometer tends for minus 9 meter and all so that's good uh, let's look at some of these nanoparticles so by definition if you go so uh nanotechnology or uh, nanomaterial you can call any um, object as nanoparticle or nanomaterial if at least one of the three dimensions of that object falls between 1 to 100 nanometer okay between 1 to 100 nanometer uh i have put in some of the nanoparticles here these are the uh, typical transmission electron microscope Uh, images of nanoparticles because due to their extremely small size we cannot see that with our naked eyes we need some uh, equipments that transmission electron microscope uh this is the size bar of 100 nanometer of course these all these particles are less than 100 nanometer you see this uh these are uh, nano rods because these are in rod shape and nano dimension so therefore you can call them as nano rods so these nano rods you if you see the length probably some of the nano rods will have length more than 100 nanometer but you can still call them nano particle because i said one of the dimensions right so you can take width as one of the dimension so of course very well this uh, uh, the, the width of these uh, nano rods is below well below 100 nanometer you can still call them nano particle similarly you can also uh, prepare triangular shape prism shape uh, nano particles uh, kind of cubes you can prepare right okay? nano you can call them as nano cubes so uh, let's move to the types of nano particles uh, just wait a minute i am unable to see my full screen so i would just adjust my this here okay great so uh, let's see uh, that what is the typical classification of uh, uh, nano materials so broadly broadly you can uh, divide them into this following six or seven categories where metal based nano particles these nano particles are made up made up of metals like gold nano particles silver nano particles copper platinum and palladium you can also have metal oxide nano particles you can have silica you can have zinc oxide you can have PiO2 you can have cerium oxide you can also have copper oxide Mn3O4 and there are several several more oxides but i have listed here just the common oxide nano particles that that are uh, research very frequently and then there's a, another category carbon based nano particles where you have carbon nanotubes graphene i hope uh, many of you have uh, heard this name uh, yeah this this carbon nanotube reminds me of my uh, you know badminton racket so that badminton racket the arm of that badminton racket is made up of carbon nanotube okay so uh, you know my my friends who are good at uh, you know playing badminton they 
they say that uh, you know when you hit a smash with my racket it, it goes really fast you know so the carbon nanotube is is very uh, very important material especially for uh, you know if you want to develop this uh, tennis racket or uh, you know uh, this uh, badminton racket for graphene i'll talk uh, about it later and then there's a very special category semiconductor based nanoparticle especially the quantum dots right so i'll be talking about this quantum dots again uh, they they are they are really really super nanoparticles and then there's a, a another category of soft nanoparticle uh, you know polymeric nanoparticles and lipid lipid based nanoparticle and i'm sure you must have heard this term liposomes and nanoliposomes we'll be talking about it uh, some of them in my um, in my lecture today you can also see here some schematic diagrams which are drawn for polymeric nanoparticles inorganic that means this metal metal oxide and quantum dots this gold nanoparticle quantum dots silicon nanoparticles iron oxide nanoparticles lipid based liposomes you know my cells emulsions all these uh, uh, can be developed uh, as as nanoparticle wait a minute what happened yeah uh, yeah this is the um, you know fantastic slide i like this this photo very much because you know here we are talking about unusual properties of nanomaterial i mean why these nanomaterials are important right because they they carry some unusual properties with them that's why they're important, right? That's why there's so much of application of, of them. So just simple example I'll give you. I hope you all have seen these gold bars, uh, if not bars, at least gold jewelry, you all must have seen, right? How they look like typically, yellow color, right? But when you develop gold nanoparticles, they are no more yellow. They are red color or even pur purple color depending on their size right can you imagine if you vary the size of these gold bars would you expect to see different colors probably no right but with gold nanoparticles this is a possibility you know you see here uh, when you have 10 nanometer gold nanoparticle suspension it looks like this 25 this 40 you know very deep wine red color 60 and onwards you see purple color so, so, so I would say this is the unusual property. It is the same material, you know, it is again gold, but you see the property. And not only that, when you run the UV visible spectrophoto uh, spectra, you will find that these uh, different uh, size gold nanoparticles will give you absorption at different wavelengths. You know the smaller the smallest nanoparticle will give you around uh, 500 uh, nanometer and the, the biggest 70 or 80 nanometer will shift towards 700 nanometers okay so this is called size dependent optical property uh, with this although i have not mentioned here but let me tell you the silver nanoparticles you know so if you see silver metal that looks uh, you know white in color but when you make silver nanoparticle, that looks like yellow, yellow color suspension it gives. Uh, and why this, uh, you know, why this uh, color change happens because of size, that's mainly because of the surface plasma resonance, which is sort of, uh, let me try to explain this. So, um, you know, Gold is metal, and in your plus two, you all must have studied that electron C model, uh, you know, uh, in, in metals, especially because they have very high number of electrons, because of that, they are good conductor, right? All that. So, so electrons in, in metals is like C. I hope you all have seen a C. So if you see the water, it, it, it floats randomly right so when there is no electromagnetic field applied to these uh, nanoparticles so then their electron cloud plasmon is electron okay so this plasmon cloud or electron cloud is randomly flowing there on the surface okay however as soon as you apply this 
you know oscillating electromagnetic field on that their uh, motion is not randomized it is uh, sort of it, it will be directed right so suddenly you will realize that there are two waves which are being produced one is because of the oscillating electromagnetic wave other is the oscillating electron cloud on the surface of gold nanoparticle right and if you recall your plus two uh, i think it was doppler effect probably or waves section uh, you will realize that you know when there are two waves they are in same phase right and at the resonance point their amplitude will increase so therefore there'll be very a high absorption of light right so same phenomena happens here that these two waves the one produced by electron cloud on nanoparticle surface and electromagnetic field at whatever wavelength they will be in phase or they will resonate that will be this point here right so you will see very strong absorption of light at that point so that's why you see that 30 nanometer 40 nanometer and 60 nanometer all these gold nanoparticles are very strongly absorbing light in this region okay other question comes why there is a different wavelength of absorption maxima at this point because when you vary the size of gold nanoparticle 30 nanometer 40 60 80 100 right the size of nanoparticle will change and so as the electron cloud will also change therefore the resonating wavelength where the two waves electromagnetic wave and uh, this um, wave generated due to electron cloud that 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 resonant point will change so therefore you will get this absorption at different wavelengths okay so let me uh, continue this discussion to uh, gold nano rods you know so in, in in case of gold nano rod if you see here you will see two peak two peaks uh one around 500 nanometer other is around 600 nanometer onwards so what happens here since this if i show you if if, if you consider this as as gold nano rod so there's a one spr happening at this direction that is transverse direction and one SPR is being generated at this, this direction here. That's the longitudinal axis. So therefore, there are two SPR being produced. That means there are two wavelengths at which the, uh, the resonance is, is happening, right? And very interestingly, if you see this, uh, you know, this is again aspect ratio dependent. If you vary the length of uh, these gold nanorod, you can see here these are smaller gold nanorod these are a little bigger and the, these are the biggest among among three so as you can vary the aspect ratio aspect ratio means length by width okay so if you vary the aspect ratio of these gold nanorods you will see their transverse transverse surface plasma resonance position also changes and similarly you see the color of this suspension will also change okay so with this uh, let me also talk about uh, this, uh, you know, unusual properties of some more nanomaterials. Uh, so here we have quantum dots. So quantum dots are basically uh, semiconductor nanoparticles and uh, their size uh, has to be really, really, uh, you know, within 10 nanometer. You, you can say between one to five or seven or 10 nanometer. So, so the, the, the interesting property with them is that like they are uh, extremely, extremely uh, fluorescent, very bright, right? So, you know, they have very high quantum yield, about 20 times brighter because quantum yield is photons emitted versus absorbed. That's how much you all might uh, recall again your plus two, where, you know, the excitation and emission uh, is spectra. Uh, if you have taken you excite the compound or any dye with certain light and then later on you receive the emission light and based on this excitation emission pattern you sort of uh, image uh, 
cells or, or other other compounds or other processes, right? So with quantum dots, you require less photons to excite them, but you get better emitted light with quantum dots. So that's why they have high quantum end. They have very narrow and symmetric emission spectra. What do you mean by narrow emission spectra? Can you see here this? This is one of the emission spectra. So in case of quantum dots, this, this uh, spectra is, is really narrow, right? So therefore, they interfere very minimally with other uh, you know, light spectra. So therefore, as narrow um, your emission spectra is, more crisp, more contrast, and better light you will receive, and better imaging uh, quality you will get. So they are more than 100 times resistant to photo bleaching. If some of you have um, you know, done some uh, microscopic imaging, especially fluorescence imaging where you use dyes. So you will realize that you know, uh, once you have seen one field, you know, and when you try to come back again to that field, you will see that the, the emitted light is really weak. That's called photo bleaching, but that's not the problem with uh, quantum dots because they are resistant to photo bleaching. They have tunable wavelength, as you can see here. You can vary the emission wavelength uh, from 400 to 4,000 nanometer. Uh, they are also resistant to photo and chemical degradation. You know your your uh, you know typical or traditional dyes. If you put in you know harsh chemicals you may not get any emission out of them, but uh, this is not the uh, issue with uh, quantum dots. Uh, I would also like to talk about one more uh, very impressive material, which is graphene here. You know, it's a basically a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb ladder, you can see here. Uh, it is the strongest material known with a breaking strength of over 100 times greater than a hypothetical steel film, if you have to you know, keep same thickness. Uh, this is very important. One square meter of graphene hammock can support four kg cat. Four kg cat, one square meter of graphene hammock, but it would only weigh as one of the cat's whiskers that's about you know, 0.77 mg. So this is that strong material. And uh, in, in, in coming future, uh, I won't be surprised to see a lot of applications of, of graphene. Uh, let's continue our discussion with this, uh, some more unusual properties. I mean, what is the reason of, of these unusual properties, what we see in nanomaterials and nanoparticles? Uh, I would like to focus on only two things, quantum confinement and enhanced surface to volume ratio. So let's understand this quantum confinement. Uh, I'm sure you know this, what is conduction band, what is balance band in a semiconductor, there's a band gap, right? In you know, conductors, you have uh, low band gap, semiconductors, you have some band gap, in poor conductor or insulators, you have wide band gap. So what happens so these, these bands, this conduction band or valence band, they have a lot of, uh, you know, this, this energy lines where electrons can be found or localized the, uh, in, in this various energy levels. But what happens, what dramatic happens when you keep on de decreasing the size of uh, the, the element or, or particle, you come at a point where there's a confinement, you know, so what happens when you come into nano dimension, when you decrease the size of object, you bring them into you know, nano dimension that's between one to 100 nanometer, at least one dimension. So the electrons within them are really confined because of size, because what happens that you are decreasing uh, the space where these electrons can move. So that, that's called confinement of electron motion. So therefore, these electrons are not free anymore, okay? So therefore, the material itself will start behaving unusually. So that gives rise to the unusual properties of nanomaterials. 
because the allowed energy levels of the electrons are confined in a region right so the allowed energy levels for the, the the confined electron is very very uh, confined very very limited so that's why the material will start behaving uh, unusually that's one thing other thing is that enhanced surface to volume ratio when you keep on uh, decreasing the size of of a matter you know uh, there will be tremendous increase in surface area to volume ratio some calculation is given here i'm not going to go into that calculation so i'll just give you the illustration that you know what happens that when you take any object like like this you know there are uh, uh, certain atoms present at the surface there are atoms present in the bulk of this material so there's an energy uh, mismatch you know when there's a high energy in the atoms which are present in bulk versus surface then the reactivity will be low but when you keep on decreasing the size of the matter so that your number of atoms present on the surface of that uh, matter is more than bulk then again that material starts behaving unusually the reactivity increases multiple fold okay so that's what happen in, in it happens in case of uh, nanoparticles uh, i hope it, it is clear so far with everyone uh, let's look at uh, the synthesis method of nanoparticles uh, you can broadly divide that into two parts top down approach and bottom up as as name suggests that in case of top down approach you need to take up you know bulk material and break it down um, in such as smaller pieces that uh, you know uh, your uh, you you come to this nano dimension you bring this this matter to nano dimension so that's one way of doing it uh, and these are the different methods that follow a top down approach of nanoparticle preparation but very famous and very successful approach is bottom up approach in which you start with atoms and molecules develop nuclei add some capping molecule or shape directing molecules and produce nanoparticles why i said shape directing because that will give you liberty to you know develop either spherical nanoparticle triangular nanoparticle you know, rectangular star shape hexagons you know so whatever shape you want you can develop i mean in in in, in current uh, um, situation i think there are protocols already available people have done enough work uh, you know by giving uh, you know clear protocols by which you can prepare mono dispersed fairly mono dispersed nanoparticle you know, whatever uh, size whatever shape you want you want rods gold nano rods you will get phase pure gold nano rods whatever aspect ratio you want there are protocols you follow that you will get that and uh, these are the uh, you know various uh, this process that uh, follow uh, bottom up approach to prepare nanoparticles so let's look at some examples of uh, you know this nano effect in nature it's not that this is a sudden science i mean it, it, it's been existing in nature since several years I'm sure you all must have seen this lotus leaf and this super hydrophobic uh, surface coating, and uh, this because of that, these water droplets are, are present there. So what happens here that there are nano projections of roughly hundred nanometer of in in height, and in these uh, nano projections of hundred nanometer, there'll be air trap. So because of this uh, trap air water droplets will write on the tips okay and will present super hydrophobic surface so therefore you will see this kind of pattern when you put water droplets droplets on it uh, other is uh, other example is you know this this gecko you can see uh, it also has um, limbs uh, which are covered with thousands of about 200 nanometer long projections so these are again uh, nanometers uh, you know dimension projections 
So as soon as the, the limb comes in the contact of wall, so there are minute gaps. So these long projections from uh, limbs will interact electrostatically with those gaps and there will be wonderful force of attraction produced and because of that they stick to uh, the the surface or the wall or they can climb on the walls uh, moving towards the applications of nanobiotechnology um, there are several several fields of you know biological and life sciences where these uh, applications of nanoparticles are realized <laughs> Uh, from imaging, gene delivery, targeted drug delivery, biosensors, DNA nanotechnology, food, agriculture, tissue engineering, wound healing, a lot many more. So in, in my further uh, lecture, I will just cover a few of these, these applications, which are really exciting. Be with me. So uh, one uh, very common and very, very famous application of this nanotechnology is uh, um, delivery of drugs or genes. You can deliver, you know, multiple drugs, multiple genes, or a combination of drug and gene for cancer treatment or even other, other disease treatment. Uh, let's say uh, diabetes, where insulin is, is an issue, so you can really deliver insulin for diabetic patients. But a lot of work has been done on, on, on cancer treatment. Um, I don't have to uh, read all these. I mean, uh, you all uh, know this, that there are, this is Indian scenario, about 2.5 million cancer patients, 1 million new cases added every year, and it is going to increase to five folds by 2015. Okay. So therefore, it is it is important to work on this um, you know drug delivery of anti-cancer drugs for for cancer patients. So a lot of nanoparticle based formulations are developed. There are several several strategies which are uh, developed uh, to address the drug delivery or gene delivery for cancer treatment. Uh, why? Because these nanoparticles exhibit high drug encapsulation okay and better intracellular uptake so as you can see here this this mesosporous uh, silica i mean this is a schematic diagram of mesosporous silica nanoparticles so they have very really, very really, uh, you know fine uh, you know holes within them pores within them and these pores are generally filled with anti cancer drugs right so therefore the very high amount of drug can be loaded in, you know, mesosporous silica nanoparticles or even liposomes or even polymeric nanoparticles, right? So very high amount of drug you can load in these nanoparticles and better intracellular uptake. This, these nanoparticles which are uh, carrying this uh, anti-cancer drug or anti-cancer agent, uh, they can be better uptaken by cancer cells. I will talk about it uh, in, in my next slide, how, but they are better uh, taken up by cancer cells. You know, uh, they can also be put in systemic circulation. So they can, uh, once uh, these uh, nanoparticles, which are carrying anti-cancer drug, once they are injected in, in, in blood, they are in the blood circulation for longer duration of time, you know there are uh, methods by which you can do it. If you can pegylate, if you can coat nanoparticles with PEG or dextran, you know, so then they are not recognized by this reticular endothelial system. So therefore they tend to uh, circulate in, in blood for longer duration of time. Because of that, what happens? Optimum level of drug is maintained in blood for longer duration of time compared to free drug when it is injected. So therefore, better therapeutic index you can expect. Uh, with nanoparticles, there's an option to, to make targeted delivery. That means you inject these nanoparticles carrying drugs in bloodstream, and then it will go and bind with the tumor tissue predominantly, not only predominantly, okay? Uh, other option is a variety of anti-cancer drug you can load 
antibiotics you can load in nanoparticles. You can have small interfering RNAs uh, loaded in nanoparticles. Plasmids you can uh, put in nanoparticles, aptamers, and other biomolecules of your interest. Whatever you can think of that it has application for a mammalian cell. If you want to deliver it into mammalian cells or tissues, you can use nanoparticles and deliver that uh, therapeutic molecule. Uh, yeah, this is one of the fantastic examples of uh, you know nanotechnology based anti-cancer drug, Doxin. Uh, it is the first FDA approved back in 1996 itself uh, for cancer treatment. This is a typical structure. It is a liposomal formulation. You see this this bottle itself says that Doxin is doxirubicin HCL liposome injection. That means this is the doxirubicin drug which is developed as a liposomal formulation. You can see here in the core of this liposome, this toxirubicin drug is there and around this lipid bilayer is present. So what it offers, especially this, this liposome, if we, we talk about prolonged uh, drug circulation, avoidance of the RES due to the usage, usage of uh, pegylated nanoliposomes, right? If you coat this polythylene glycol molecule, you can see the surface, you have option, you have methods available by which you can coat the surface of nanoparticles with polythylene glycol molecules. Then it will not be recognized as a foreign object by reticuloendothelial system of the body. Therefore, it will be in the circulation. High and stable loading you know, in liposomes, you can have very high loading of doxirubicin drug. Uh, then there's an EPR effect that happens that I will talk about uh, EPR effect and passive targeting in my next slide, not here. Uh, so this is, this is one of the strategies where they use this, uh, developing this liposomal formulation of one drug that was doxirubicin, but there are, you know, better strategies, new strategies where people have come up with you know, dual drug encapsulation and delivery. They have uh, they have sort of identified that if you can encapsulate two drugs in one liposome, and if you deliver that, you will get better uh, anti-cancer activity or better uh, therapeutic index. As you can see here in this um, um, data, there are two drugs taken, celecoxib and plumbagin. Different concentration, 30 micromole per liter, 40 and 50 of silicoxib will not uh, kill very significantly the cancer cells. Similarly, the plumbagin, uh, just five micromole per liter of concentration will kill only 10% of, of cancer cells. Whereas when you combine this five uh, micromole per liter of plumbagin with 30, 40 or 50 micromole of silicoxib, you see this dramatic decrease in cell viability. This happens because of the synergistic effect of both of these drugs, probably because they are probably targeting two independent signaling pathways within the cancer cells and ultimately, you know, um, inducing apoptosis in, in cancer cells. So these, both of these drugs were encapsulated in a liposome <coughs> form and then uh, these liposomal formulation was used for to study anti-cancer activity. So you can see here, this is uh, the data from uh, xenograph tumor generated uh, from uh, you know melanoma cancer uh, cells. You can see here then when plumbagin encapsulated in liposome was given alone or silicoxib uh, encapsulated in liposome was given alone, they had no drop in tumor growth or tumor volume, and they were very similar to the empty liposome. That's, that's, that's it control. Whereas there was significant drop in tumor volume when this uh, silicoxib and plumbagin both, when they both were put in uh, this liposome and, and given to the animal model. So that suggests that when you have uh, two drugs put in one liposome, and if you deliver that, then you are expected to get better results. Uh, similarly, uh, there are uh, strategies where people have uh, uh, taken plasmids 
and delivered plasmids in, in uh, cancer cells. Um, so in this case, there was a P10 plasmid. Uh, you know, this P10 is a tumor suppressor gene, uh, which is required in, in, in mammalian uh, system, which will keep an eye on any uh, tumor formation and their function is to suppress, you know, the tumor formation. But what happens, these, these cancer cells are very smart. So they, they will mutate this P10 itself, you know, so that there's no checkpoint on this tumor generation, okay? So either when there's a loss of P10 or there's a mutation, or if there's a P10 protein is not being expressed in mammalian cell system, then it will give rise to cancer formation, right? So in this study, what people did, they thought of like taking this P10 plasmid itself and deliver that to a P10 deficient uh, cancer cells, right? So what they found is that when they take GFP P10 plasmid, where GFP is a green fluorescein protein conjugated this, this P10. So that means if, if you see this green uh, protein uh, you know, expression uh, that that corroborates with uh, you know P10 expression. So, so this was really possible that this GFP P10 plasmid can be put in uh, liposomes, and these liposomes can be delivered in uh, uh, cancer cells, which generally do not express P10, and then the P10 expression can be uh, can be realized again. So this was another strategy. Uh, yeah, so uh, talking about this targeted delivery, you know, so um, in case of, uh, you know, cancer cells, uh, they also uh, undergo this, this angiogenesis. So what happens, they, the, the, the kind of vascular system they develop, that's a defective vascular system, because in their uh, uh, blood vessels, will find around 600 to 800 nanometer wide gaps between the endothelial cells. You can see here that these are the endothelial cells, but, and these, these are the tumor tissues. So in the region of tumor tissue, the endothelial cells will have this, this gaps, okay? So this is called defective vascular system. <clears throat> Unlike, uh, you know, non-tumorogenic angiogenesis where you will not have these, uh, these, these gaps, okay? So these gaps are around 600 to 800 nanometer. And if you uh, remember my second slide where I mentioned that nanoparticles by definition, particles around 100 nanometer at least in one dimension, right? So this 600 to 800 nanometer wide gaps are perfectly enough for these nanoparticles to extra visage, that means to get out or leak out from these uh, blood vessel to nearby cancer tissues, okay? So this is called enhanced permeability and retention effect, EPR effect, okay? So this, so this EPR effect is considered as passive targeting. Passive targeting means you are not targeting, uh, you are not uh, directing nanoparticles to get into those cancer tissue region, but they are going by, they are being, they are, they are accumulating in this tumor region because of EPR effect. So it has been found that around tenfold increase in drug retention compared to free drug, okay? Compared to free drug, when you have drug encapsulated in nanoparticles, liposomes, polymers, or even the surface of nanoparticles, if you have, uh, you know, adhered uh, drugs, then there's a tenfold increase in drug retention because of EPR effect. And that EPR effect is due to this leaky vasculature in tumor region. Then uh, active targeting, what happens that you sort of, at the surface of nanoparticles, you sort of attach some of the uh, targeting ligands that can be antibodies, right? Aptamers. So these antibodies or aptamers, they are very, very specific for the certain receptors 
present on only cancer uh, cells. These receptors will not be there on normal cells or healthy cells. Therefore, these nanoparticles which are targeted, they will have less probability to get into normal or healthy cells, but will have more probability to get into tumorous or, or cancerous cells, okay? So one of the examples you can see here of the targeted delivery is curcumin loaded uh, galactosylated BSA nanoparticles. So what they did here, they made this BSA nanoparticle and then they coated this BSA nanoparticle with galactose. Why? Because galactose will be, will have receptors, specific receptors on hepatocellular carcinoma. This receptor is called ASGPR. Okay, so, so whatever is coated with galactose will have tendency to get into this uh, hepatocellular carcinoma cell through this ASGPR receptor. So what they did, they made this BSA nanoparticle and decorated this with uh, the surface of this BSA nanoparticle with uh, galactose. And then they encapsulated curcumin within this BSA nanoparticle. So it's kind of Trojan horse mechanism, you know. So this, this curcumin is hidden within the BSA nanoparticles. And, uh, but what this cell sees is the only galactose, right? So it will take galactose inside and along with that, these uh, curcumin, which is encapsulated or hidden within BSA nanoparticles will also get into it. And we all know this curcumin has uh, anti-cancer and many therapeutic effect. So uh, then when they perform this uh, cell inhibition rate, they found that this, this uh, galactose BSA curcumin nanoparticle showed maximum cell growth inhibition because of this mechanism. So this is one of the examples of uh, targeted uh, delivery. Uh, <clears throat> let's move to other application where uh, you know this nanoparticles can also be used as imaging probe. So what kind of nanoparticles are being used as uh, imaging probe? Carbon nanotubes, quantum dots, silica nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, uh, <coughs> super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. There are several, several types of nanoparticles. Even some other oxides are also uh, being um, used uh, for Im um, imaging purposes. You can see here, you know, ultrasound imaging, PET, MRI, optical imaging, and uh, computer tomography, and this gold, quantum dots, iron oxide. So these are different nanoparticles, uh, carbon nanotubes. These are the different nanoparticles which are being investigated for, uh, you know, imaging, uh, as imaging agent for, uh, you know, these, these imaging uh, probabilities. So let's look at this, uh, one of the studies. Um, so here what happened that, uh, you know, this gold nanoclusters. So let me uh, clarify here this, uh, that uh, this gold nanoclusters and gold nanoparticles, both are different in terms of size, in terms of properties, okay? Gold, nano, gold nanoclusters are less than five nanometer in diameter. So if you remember my quantum dot discussion, where I mentioned that quantum dots are always less than 10 nanometer in diameter. And that's why they show that, you know, excellent emission properties. So same property will be shown by gold nanoclusters because they are extremely small in size. So therefore they, they show this fluorescence property, okay? But gold nanoparticles, which are, you know, more than 10 nanometer in diameter, they do not show this fluorescence property, okay? So this <clears throat> gold nanoclusters will show this uh, uh, emission property. You can see here under uh, UV light, if you put this gold nanocluster suspension, you will see very bright red color. You know? So these gold nanoclusters were coated with glucose. Why glucose? Because uh, <clears throat> you know this uh, in PET imaging, uh, normally the patient is injected with this uh, uh, glucose derivative fluoro 2 deoxy glucose, which is uh, radio labeled, you know. So what happens because of this glucose, this, this glucose, this, this molecule will preferentially 
localized in, in, in tumor region. And because of this, um, you know, radioactive material, you will get, uh, you will get radioactive signal from that particular region. And on that basis, you can claim that person has tumor in this region. Okay. So, so therefore, it was developed that, you know, this gold nanocluster, if they are coated with glucose, can they be selectively taken up again by uh, cancer cells? Plus, the advantage here is that you don't have any radioactive material, right? So, when investigation was done, it was found that, uh, you know, even if you change the polarization of cancer cells, whether you make them <clears throat> depolarized or hyperpolarized, the uptake of this glucose coated gold nanocluster was not altered. That means the uptake of the glucose coated gold nanocluster is not charge based. Okay. So <clears throat> then it was again investigated that uh, there are GLUT receptors which are responsible for this, uh, you know, glucose uptake. So then um, um, there's a drug called genistine. This genistine uh, will inhibit the, you know, the function of GLUT receptors. So when this genistein treatment was given to uh, cells, and then when this glucose-coated gold nanoclusters were exposed, there was no uptake of glucose-coated gold nanoclusters that suggested that, you know, this glucose-coated gold nanoclusters uh, can be <clears throat> used as, as, uh, as an alternative to FDG if developed further uh, in a more precise way. Uh, and then let's look at another imaging agent, quantum dot. So uh, this is again, um, uh, cadmium sulfide and cadmium selenide based quantum dots, which is again coated with uh, PS, P PSMA. So this is prostate specific um, antigen. So it was found that the cells, C42 cells that were expressing PSMA, so this quantum dot was um, uh, readily uptaken, whereas the cells which were expressing uh, the prostate specific receptors, but the quantum dots were not coated with PSMA, but with PEG, they did not enter, okay? So uh, again, this uh, the, the initial property of uh, this uh, quantum dot was again compared with, uh, you know, the common fluorophorin, the 488, you can see that there was significant photo bleaching of Alexa 488 streptovidine, even with anti-fade medium, you see that there's a you know constant uh, fading. Whereas in case of quantum dot, the initial intensity or brightness was maintained. You can also see here that uh, you know when there's a Alexa 488 use, there was photo bleaching. After eight minutes, you won't see anything. Whereas with quantum dot, you see the same uh, intensity uh, of brightness. Uh, it is also possible to put these quantum dots in, in animals, different size, different color producing quantum dots. You can put in animals and you can image them. Uh, there's also possibility of pathogen detection. Uh, you know, iron oxide and gold nanoparticles are the most common, you know, nanoparticle types that are used for pathogen detection. So if you have a specific antibodies like H antigen, the antibody to target H antigen, which are present on flagella of bacteria, you can target that. And, or if you have antibodies, your iron oxide or gold nanoparticle conjugated with antibodies specific to O antigen, and these O antigens are present on the surface of uh, these uh, microbes, you can selectively target using these nanoparticles, either flagella or uh, uh, body of uh, bacteria. Um, you know, I'll skip this. Uh, uh, I'll talk very briefly about this uh, <clears throat> nanozymes. We all know this, um, 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 you know, importance of enzymes in our body, um, you know, our digestive system and uh, every biochemistry of our body is, is regulated by various enzymes. So there's again possibility of uh, uh, developing nanoparticles that will mimic the function of uh, certain important enzymes or of, of biological system. If I name some catalase and superoxide dismutase enzymes. 
So we know that these catalase and SOD enzymes are predominantly antioxidant enzymes, and they take care of you know, the excess of free radicals uh, that are constantly produced in our body. So therefore, there are nanoparticles that can be developed and then can be used um, uh, to function as uh, exactly as catalase enzyme or SOD enzyme. Uh, and then again, there are nanoparticles that can be used to produce free radicals. You can bring, you can, you can put them into categories of oxidase and peroxidase. Uh, both of these uh, uh, categories of biological enzymes, natural enzymes, or nanozymes, they both produce free radicals. And then you can use these free radicals for various applications. I will show some. Uh, I know you, you all know this, uh, the variety of you know, free radicals being produced in biological system. And uh, central to all these free radicals is superoxide radical H2O2 and peroxy nitride. And nanoparticles are shown to scavenge all three types of these free radicals. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, I'll skip this as well. Uh, I'll come to this pro-oxidant and nanozymes where uh, these uh, uh, nanozymes they, they, they produce uh, free radicals. So in, in case of copper oxide nanorod, it was found that uh, <clears throat> you know, they, can, um, they can produce in presence of H2O2, they can produce excess of hydroxyl radical and more in presence of light than dark and at pH four than pH seven because the peroxidase activity that these uh, copper oxide nanorod, they show that peroxidase activity is the basis of generation of hydroxyl radical and that peroxidase activity happens at pH 4, okay? So therefore, at pH 4 and under the condition of light, we produce more hydroxyl radical. Therefore, you get more bacterial cell death in this case and less at pH 7. This is a TM image. Um, so as it, it suggests that under visible light um, irradiation, more of hydroxyl radical will kill more of bacteria. So this is one of the examples where you can develop antimicrobial um, agents using this nanoparticle. Other example is iron oxide with ATP. So the beauty with this study was that when you combine iron oxide with ATP, this peroxidase activity, which was happening at pH 4, now it can happen at pH 7.4. And it was found that at pH 7.4, it can produce hydroxyl radicals and it can show antibacterial activity, not only antibacterial, antibiophil activity as well. Uh, theranostic. Um, so nanomaterial can also be developed at theranostic. Theranostic means they can be used as therapeutics as well as diagnostics. You can have imaging agent as well as therapeutic agent, both in one nanoparticle and you can realize the application. You can real time, in real time, you can follow off the, you know, the progression of uh, disease, or healing of, of disease, you know. So uh, that's how you can, I mean, you can develop uh, theranostics. Uh, I'll not discuss uh, this here. Uh, yeah, this is my uh, probably last slide. And um, I will discuss this here. The standard technology are also used for, uh, you know, uh, program food of uh, food or fruit preservation delivery. So in this case, graphene oxide was taken and salic salicyl aldehyde, which is, um, you know, preservative, very well-known preservative that was conjugated with graphene oxide and uh, a fruit uh, wrapper was developed uh, from this graphene oxide and salicyl aldehyde uh, conjugate. You can see this here. So what happens here <coughs> is that uh, the release of salicyl aldehyde happens with pH. So as fruit will ripen up, it will produce acidic medium. And under that acidic condition, the salicyl aldehyde will release. Okay, So that is the preservative agent. So that will delay the fruit ripening. Okay, So other thing is that uh, direct uh, the salicylic aldehyde application we have to avoid because it is not good for health. So therefore, you can develop a wrapper and you can wrap, for example, this banana and you can, uh, you know, get this preservation of your 
fruit or delayed ripening of the fruit. Uh, this is my <coughs> slide, especially for uh, you know uh, BSc and MSc students, because at this stage students are really confused. So, if you are really motivated with the talk or uh, with this talk, or if you have you know attended other talks on nanotechnology or nanobiotechnology, you should know that in India there are uh, several nanotechnology center of excellence where dedicated, uh, these, these centers are dedicated for nanoscience and nanotechnology research work. If you are really interested in carrying research further, you can look up to um, these, these center of excellence. Apart from these center of excellence, there are uh, other various research centers which are funded by DST, DBT, CSIR, Central Universities, NITs, ICERTs, IITs, all list is that several state universities are doing fantastic research on nanotechnology. You may look at their websites. There are several courses in nanotechnology like MSc, MTech, even PhD in nanoscience and technology being offered by uh, several universities in India and abroad. And these are your uh, you know, possible uh, industries where uh, you may be uh, you know, hired as a, a nanotechnology expert, textile, biotechnology, medical field, food science, forensic, and of course, research industries. Uh, with this, I will finish my talk and I, I thank you all very much for, for paying your attention here. I'll be happy to answer if, if there are any questions. And the students, uh, uh, if you are um, you know, interested in joining you know, my lab or, uh, you know, you are free to look at my website and then I'll be happy to sort of help you if you need any help or short training or anything, ESD or whatever, whatever way I can help you. I, I would be happy to help you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry for a brief technical glitch. Uh, so it is really wonderful. Uh, Dr. Singh has given us a complete outline of the application of nanoscience from basic to its application. I hope you uh, all have enjoyed this talk. Now it is open for questions. Okay, I'll invite all the students who have a question, you can type it in the chat box or raise your hands as well. Yeah, anybody go ahead. So, so uh, Dr. Singh, I yeah. have a uh, quick question, yeah. especially uh, the application of nanoparticles based deliveries for vaccines. Okay. okay. So uh, there are a lot of question comes in, uh, in terms of uh, toxicities for nanoparticles and for many of the nanoparticles, how they are metabolized and excreted are known are not known. So, uh, so far, whatever nanoparticles has been in the market, um, not many has been used in uh, the existing vaccines. So what are the potential uh, nanoparticles that are possibly are will be good uh, vaccine carriers? Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, so uh, for vaccine delivery, as I was talking about uh, this um, liposomes and, and uh, polymeric nanoparticles. So these would be the good candidate for uh, vaccine delivery because uh, these uh, polymeric nanoparticles or liposomes are uh, biocompatible. They are not toxic. Plus you can have dextran coating, you can have uh, you know, PEG coating to further increase their biocompatibility. So, so these, uh, these would be uh, the preferred candidate for uh, vaccine delivery. Okay. Uh, other oxide or metal nanoparticles or quantum dots, as you mentioned, they might cause uh, toxicity in long term because uh, we don't know what is the biodistribution where this bioaccumulation will happen in, in, in body. So therefore, uh, those nanoparticles probably would not be the preferred candidates uh, for vaccine delivery or any, any delivery applications if we're talking about humans or animals. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Singh, you can actually now stop sharing the screen. It seems somebody is writing something. Okay, wait a minute. I think I did. Stop sharing. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, anybody else had any question? Participants, it is very important that you uh, throw a question to the speaker. And we are here for you guys only. I don't know whether this, they have been allowed for not. Like just a second. No, there's, there's a question, uh, Papa. Th there is a question. Hello. Uh, uh, is everybody allowed now for uh, unmuting? Okay. Thanks. Uh, are Nagalu drugs based on nanotechnology. nanotechnology? Okay, so there is a question in the chat box uh, which reads like this. Uh, are there nasal root drugs based on nanotechnology? Means basically, uh, can drug be delivered through nasal root yeah, using nanotechnology uh, delivery uh, vehicles? Please add. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, there is no FDA approved intranasal uh, nanotechnology-based strategy so far, uh, but uh, there are some good reports. Uh, I think I read one in PNAS a uh, few months back that uh, there's a possibility that you can develop actually uh, this using this nanotechnology intranasal uh, drug delivery. So there's a possibility people are uh, working towards it and you may hear pretty soon that there's already available one. Okay, so so participants, if you have any question, you can also unmute and ask question directly because you are not getting that many questions. Uh, you can unmute and ask. Fine. So uh, I, it seems uh, they, your uh, lecture was pretty clear to understand. So um, um, all the participants understood uh, most of it. Uh, that's great. But I will still uh, request all the participants to really uh, make it a more interactive session that benefits both of us to learn uh, the kind of question that is coming from undergrad students plus uh, that will also allow us to express our uh, scientific experience, laboratory-based experience to share with you. Uh, for today, we thank our today's speaker, Dr. Sanjay Singh, for his wonderful talk, and also all the participants to make yourself available and uh, participating in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Papa. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Yeah.